Salt Lake City, the Damn These Heels Queer Film Festival is right around the corner and looking good. Watch queer films from around the world and pay what you can to do it because your ticket is whatever you can afford. There will also be workshops for filmmakers, a community clubhouse, and a very special night with Miss Coco Peru. October 12th through 15th at the Rose Wagner. Get tickets now at damntheseheels.org. Here's what Salt Lake's talking about. There are a lot of layers to the news about Utah Tim Ballard and his global anti-human trafficking organization, Operation Underground Railroad. There's the public rebuke by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sexual misconduct allegations against Ballard himself, news that a psychic provided intel for rescue missions, and pages of reports claiming he lied to donors. Utah's own attorney general, Sean Reyes, is now distancing himself from Ballard, a man he was about to endorse for Utah's open U.S. Senate seat and had previously called his partner. But beneath all the salacious details, there's a case study about doing good in our communities. It's Wednesday, October 4th. I'm Ali Vallarta, and this is CityCast Salt Lake. Cassie Bingham, you are the assistant director of the Center for Social Impact at Utah Valley University. Social impact work, as I understand it, is how to create positive social change based on community need. So Operation Underground Railroad is famous for their high drama rescue missions abroad. And you've been on your fair share of volunteer trips. How has your experience shaped your view of this type of work? I, back in my late teens, early 20s, like a lot of young millennials, I like wanted to infuse meaning in my life and I wanted to make change in my society. And so I feel like I was really caught up in kind of the storytelling machine around like voluntourism. Like, oh, you have to go abroad. You need to like help save small, usually brown and black children (laughs) who are suffering. It was just what I was exposed to. Like I just, I hadn't been taught any of analytical skills around, I guess, the root causes behind like social problems and social issues um, because I was still really young. Mm -hmm. As I got into college, I studied social science. I did social anthropology for my undergrad and then later sociology for my graduate degree. And I did start to pick up some of like the critical thinking skills that kind of helped lead me to where I am today. Um, but along that journey, I still engaged in some like volunteer work that I I now would not engage in and that I wouldn't encourage anybody else to engage in. And that mm-hmm. included some like quote unquote humanitarian work in East Africa, in Uganda. These trips were kind of like contextualized by the organization hosting that it would be co-collaborative, you know, with the local community and that it would be ethical because no matter what the impact was, the intention was good. That was kind of the story being told. Um, And I just became disillusioned really quickly. I became disillusioned myself as a Black person uh, being abroad and kind of feeling a little bit icky about the power dynamics when it came to being like an American uh, myself, but also an American on teams that were mostly white in communities that were mostly not white. And also being really uninformed about like the political circumstances and and things. And then I think I was helped through my college experience and my professional experience to start to give articulation to why I was feeling icky. So now I'm very skeptical of organizations that do like work abroad that is, especially if it comes through like a very savioristic lens. Got it. With that information, you've been following this news closely of Tim Ballard and what I think we could probably safely call potentially the fall of Operation Underground Railroad. You're not alone. The internet is absolutely abuzz, completely embroiled in all of this. Theories, discourse about OUR, Operation Underground Railroad. Why do you think this story has captured people's imaginations? Oh, man. I think there's so many reasons, <laughs> which is why it's so intriguing because it's multi-layered. I think it's captured people's imaginations out, even outside of the state of Utah because of like the greater political divide. 
in the country and kind of the storytelling that's happening along that divide. The storytelling of like either America and kind of who gets to represent as like an authentic American being still like seen as like a hero figure in the world versus on the other political side kind of being seen as as more of like an antagonist. So I think it's intriguing in the way that Tim Ballard was really made to be the face of OUR and even beyond that for those who've really like gotten in deep with this stuff. They might go back several years when Tim Ballard was fundraising with Glenn Beck and was being painted by a famous conservative painter like the painting that everybody refers to is is Tim Ballard holding like a brown child and like Harriet Tubman and other <laughs> American historical figures are like kneeling in reverence yeah. to Tim Ballard as he stands on like a railroad, right? And so that is like, to me, is just the epitome of kind of like the red-blooded, like blonde male American coming to save the day. And it has these like cross sections of like religious visuals as well and religious themes And so I think that just from like an American identity standpoint, it's hitting at the heart of like the controversy and the divide between where is America going and who and what is and who is America. I think on a local level, oh, my God, there's just so many things here for (laughs) Utahns. It's a parfait. Like, I don't even know exactly where to start. But, you know, I think the flashpoint, obviously, in recent days has been the church publicly condemning Tim Ballard. And I've been fascinated as somebody who was active in the LDS church for 26 years of my life. Um, I, I still follow, you know, culturally church trends and, all, and many of my family members are active church members. So it's interesting to me to see kind of the socio-political movement of members And this is maybe one of the first times that I've seen more conservative leaning or like explicitly conservative ideologically members who are like questioning the church Mm -hmm. publicly as in social media and online, you know, saying like, I might leave because of this. And I, I usually have only seen that if it's something the church has done and people on the left, you know, are saying this is my last straw or this is the nail in the coffin I'm leaving. It feels like it's becoming a bit of a showdown between the church and Tim Ballard and his followers. One of the questions I have is like, has he lost power in all of this? I think we're starting to see that he's losing power because I wasn't expecting Sean Reyes to pull back from like supporting his candidacy for the open Senate seat. That's Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes. Yeah, that was a surprise to me. It makes me think that there's still more evidence that's going to come out about, you know, the sexual harassment allegations and things like that. So I think in terms of seeing that the church, you know, was a huge blow to lose the support of the church, but then to lose the support even of like big conservative political figures like the attorney general is going to be a big blow. On the other hand, we've seen with like Trump that even when he lost kind of like traditional backing, there were times when when that actually added to his power. So I'm interested to see if Tim Ballard might gain power in kind of like the cult following that is going to react strongly to any rebuke towards him. When was the last time? Do you Is there one in recent memory for you when the church went toe to toe with an individual member that had a big following? Yeah, the last one that most Utahns will remember was with Kate Kelly. Um, Kate Kelly was a, a feminist. She no longer lives in Utah who, you know, went up against the church on wanting to ordain women to the priesthood, which isn't isn't sanctioned by the church. Uh, there was maybe a, one that was a little lesser known to folks who aren't Mormon, who was a man excommunicated because he went up against the church on doing private worthiness interviews with children. The church has a practice of adult men being in a room alone with minors and asking them questions about their worthiness, including things that touch on like sexual worthiness. And so he was saying this isn't an appropriate practice for minors when he was excommunicated because of his following. Uh, I can't remember his name, but that happened a little bit more recently than Kate Kelly. Huh. Okay. Well, even before this news, I know that you have used Operation Underground Railroad as a case study in your social impact classes. So what is OUR's impact like? In my class, I try to help students become like impact literate. We talk Mm -hmm. about metrics that support impact claims, right? So if an organization in the community claims to be addressing homelessness, 
we say like, well, what data are they measuring that correlates with the actions they take in the community that actually like supports the claim that they're addressing homelessness or improving outcomes for unsheltered people. Okay. So with that, we would use OUR because it was so blatant. As soon as students would kind of learn to be impact literate, they would go to the website and search for metrics and data and they wouldn't be able to find them. <laughs> They'd be able to find basically numbers of like how many expeditions Tim Ballard had gone on. They'd be able to find like numbers of like how many people were quote unquote saved from sex trafficking, uh, but they couldn't find any metrics that led to any support for like, is there aftercare for victims who are who are saved, right? What are their long-term outcomes like? Are they returning to the sex trafficking industry uh, because they don't have any other opportunities? Like there was no story and that's a huge red flag in the impact world. If we can't see longevity and if we can't see sustainability, then we're missing the real impact of the story, right? The action is just an action, but the impact is what follows the action. And we couldn't find it. And that's very similar to the critique that OUR has received from other sex trafficking organizations that for years have said, we don't actually work with OUR because they don't actually follow through with the impact of their actions. All of it is for kind of like the shock value of showing people these like saving missions, but we don't actually know what happens to the victims afterwards. So that was one thing. The other thing is that there's often a red flag if an impact organization uses like a hero narrative and like surrounds one person with it. So Tim Ballard was yeah. just like this, you know, celebrity instead of being about collective action, collaborative action, or like a network of actors who were like strategically collaborating. It always came back to him. And a lot of organizations use some type of like story, right, as like their grounding story. But it, it was so excessive where it was like always about Tim Ballard in the end. Um, and so just from like a communication standpoint, that's really hard to square with like really impactful work. If you don't have something else like counterbalancing that to show that there's like collective action. It was just an easy <laughs> case study. I try to, I try to use local organizations um, so that my students can like relate to the organizations that they're looking at. And, and it wasn't meant to like shame any organizations. It was more to say, how do we as community members become skilled at like vetting the organizations that we might support with our donation dollars or in other ways? Hey, Salt Lake, it's Allie. I think we have a great beer scene here. One of our OGs, Epic Brewing, has even recently closed their Colorado location to dig deep on all things Salt Lake City. So I'm hyped to let you know that Epic Brewing has a new beverage in town, and it is a canned cocktail, folks, the Utah Mule. Like any Moscow Mule, it's made with real ginger and lime, but they create the alcohol by fermenting cane sugar instead of using vodka which means you can buy it at the grocery store. If you are not a fan of ginger, no problem. Try their hard coconut water, which they make with sea salt. Delicious. Skip the line at the liquor store either way and pick up a six pack of Epic Brewing's Utah Mule or hard coconut water at any Harmon's Grocery. Or you can visit them in person at 825 South State Street, where they are open seven days a week. Hey Salt Lake, it's Emily. You know we're all about celebrating local at CityCast Salt Lake. So we like highlighting businesses that are on the same wavelength as us. Like Harmon's Grocery. They love offering as many local choices as they can. From farmers, to cottage artisans, to community craftsmen. They put a lot of effort into stocking their stores with items from Utah-based businesses. We are talking more than 5,000 local items on their shelves. For me, it's about the cheese, chocolate, and produce. I love picking up a wedge of beehive cheddar, a ritual chocolate bar, fresh fruit from local farmers. And look at that. With one trip to Harmon's, you've got yourself a little local snack board for your next girl dinner. Harmon's believes the more we all support our neighbors who run local businesses, the better it is for all of us. Shop for local items at your local Harmon's. It does feel like it is 
about Tim Ballard in the end. Because what we're seeing now, for example, online is criticism from supporters of OUR who say that if you don't believe in Ballard or if you're pointing out the flaws in this work, you are now pro-human trafficking. Like they are drawing this line, which is quite the assumption, pretty unsettling. What is it about this issue that gets people so up in arms? It's the fact that depending on your political ideology, your ideas about why this issue is a problem, the root causes behind the issue are wildly different. I lean left, but I definitely believe sex trafficking is an issue. <laughs> However, right. if you asked me about the system around sex trafficking, some of the things I would talk about would be like the intersectionality of the issue. By and large, um, folks who are sex trafficked are trafficked by people they already know, not by like somebody who snatches them at a Walmart. And so that would be an intersection. By and large, people who are sex trafficked globally are from lower socioeconomic classes. And in a lot of Western countries, that means that they're also mostly not white. And so I would ask about those intersections and how much priority we give to communities who are poor and how much priority we give to communities who are black and brown. And then I would say, how do we address some of these systemic elements? But when you have an ideological faction who has chosen this as an issue that they care about, but on the other hand, a lot of their talking heads in the media say things like systemic racism doesn't exist. We're going to address that issue in a f completely different way because they're not even going to look at the intersections I just mentioned. Or they might say that they have different ideas about how to address the wealth gap or how to address like class inequality. Mm -hmm. And so I think for that reason, it's difficult to like there's all these other things. It's not just like whether or not you care about sex trafficking. And another example I can give just to balance the table a little bit is like people really believed in Black Lives Matter as an organization, right? Black Lives Matter, I think, is a little bit more resilient because they have local chapters all over the United States that dictate themselves. However, like the public face of Black Lives Matter was Alicia Garza and the other two women with her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was like a bombshell article when you found out that they were using donation dollars to purchase like a huge mansion for themselves and their friends and family. And so when everything is revolving around one or two or three people, then an entire like issue or cause can like s swim or sink with that individual. And it can really hurt the reputation of, of that cause. And so similarly, we can still believe in like fighting for equity for black folks and communities, <laughs> you know, addressing like police brutality towards black people. And we can be critical of like the founders of Black Lives Matter and like how they chose to act. Right. So it's like, the, this nuance that is really needed <laughs> that is not a part of our, our current societal discourse. It's hard, though, when all of this, a lot of this ideology is being funneled through a religious institution whose very core is the idea of a savior, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. saviorism is the teaching and, yeah. in some ways, the practice. Yeah, 100%. I think that the ethos behind that being consistent with the way that people engage with nonprofit organizations, it makes sense why that would be a compelling narrative um, for a lot of people if their deepest spiritual beliefs are also grounded in, in a savior narrative. I mean, that's where it gets a little bit like sticky for me because as a former LDS person and also as somebody who has engaged really like deeply in social impact strategy um, and what that looks like when we look for like, how do we do good in the community? How do we do good in the world? And how do we change the parts of society that are broken? I personally have like drifted a lot away from kind of like the individualistic savior approach and more into like a collective action approach. And it's difficult because it, it doesn't jive. Even if you didn't grow up religious, our brains are just like comfy with a linear story, right? You want like a, an A to B story and you want to be able to say, well, if we just rely on this person, this will happen. Like even Marvel, like this is not just LDS people, right? Like the, yeah. like the, like Westerners love and probably worldwide, we love a savior story because it simplifies everything and it feels mm -hmm. cozy to our brains in my impact classes, we, I teach systems theory, which is about 
breaking down a system around a problem like sex trafficking. Um, it's way more challenging because you do have to like wade through nuance and you have to wade through complexity. And it asks you to get out of like silos and recognize that you're going to need the input in the hands of like a lot of different people, a lot of different brains, a lot of different types of work and collaboration styles are going to be necessary to address a complex problem. Something as big as sex trafficking will never be solved by one hero or one tool or one route. Like it's going to be a multifaceted, multi-pronged approach. It, it's yeah. hard to think that way. It, it asks more of us. On that note, I mean, how do you think this whole debacle is going to shape this work in the future or perceptions of this work in the future? Because the point of pride for Utahns is our spirit of volunteerism. So how do we do good in communities that we don't belong to? Or should we at all? What I hope for, I don't know if this will actually happen, <laughs> but actually I, I, I think it will. I work with like 18 to 26 year olds. And I would okay. say that things like this are helping them to think more critically about mm -hmm. the way that they engage. And a big phrase that's really popular with that age set is like, intent doesn't equal impact. I think it's a compassionate phrase because it's not shaming people for their intentions. Like so many of us across the political divide, we have the same intentions. Like we want to see our world better. We want to see our communities thrive. But just because we have those intentions doesn't mean that that automatically brings positive impact. There's critical thinking and systems thinking that happens between point A, your intent, and point B, your impact. And so I hope that people, as they hear these stories, it's really salacious and juicy. And I love diving into all of <laughs> the weirdness of it yeah. on like just like a cultural level as a as a salt laker and everything um, but I also hope just like big picture that people will take away like okay there's more critical and system thinking that needs to go into whatever my cause is if I care about homelessness downtown Salt Lake City um, if I care about racial equity if I care about sex trafficking how am I being critical in the way that I vet the organizations I support if I myself am a practitioner who has the opportunity to like be an actor in the way we address these issues, like how am I thinking about the way that I act and am I collaborating and what are the motivations and what are the metrics we're tracking to understand if we're actually making a difference, right? Um, and then the number one thing I would say <laughs> out of all of this is are we asking the communities that actually suffer from these problems what they want? Because all mm. along the way, OUR and Tim Ballard now, um, as he's become more under a microscope, have been like validly criticized for years by other organizations and by brown and black communities who are saying these methods are not what we're asking for. These methods create other problems. They've already been criticizing it and maybe a lot of Utahns have not heard, but hopefully this light that's been shed on everything, I hope that they'll be more susceptible to listening to the stories of like community members. So whatever somebody's cause is, I, I hope that they are being led by like the lived experience of those who actually suffer from the problem that they're attempting to address. Cassie Bingham with UVU's Center for Social Impact. Thank you so much for your expertise. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Ellie. The biannual global gathering of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints took place over the weekend. It's called General Conference. And a lot of people wondered if we would hear more from church leaders about Tim Ballard and Operation Underground Railroad. Nothing was said directly, but Bishop W. Christopher Waddell gave a resounding sermon warning of the dangers of hero worship. Bishop Waddell called it a golden calf, and some are calling that a subtweet. That is all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. Thank you for listening. We will be back tomorrow morning with more from around this city. Bye.